All right, folks, I'm Rich Folley. You're watching PBS Books' ongoing coverage of AWP 2019. What a privilege it is right now to be sitting with Mira Jacob, who's the author of Good Talk, a memoir on conversations. Yes. Just out. Just out. Beautiful book. Amazing illustrations, so nice to have you here. Thank you, thanks for having me. Let's talk about the book a little bit. You've yeah. got this incredible style of storytelling in here. It is a graphic novel type of approach. You did all the illustrations yourself. All these people from your life, this memoir style presentation, yeah. you drew and drop in, and we see them repeated throughout the book in various stages. But just the drawing itself, just the illustrations itself must have taken enormous amount of time. It did also because I had never drawn a book before. Um, and I had never kind of tried, I'd never tried to draw a book. I never thought it was a thing I could do. Um, and what I ended up doing was sort of pitching the book and saying, I, this is the kind of book I want to make. And then afterward going into a deep soul panic because I was like, I've never done this. What do I do? Yeah. So It's beautiful though. And like honestly, you. like you, you did end up nailing it. And the backgrounds are incredible as well, and you did all those too. I did, yeah, I did. Um, well, I actually, some of the backgrounds are pictures I took, some of them yeah. are stock, some of them are, I had friends of mine that I would say, can you go out to you know, Highway 56 and take a shot from this angle, and they would get it for me, yeah. so a well, lot of people. It's really beautiful, I mean, that's the first element. If anybody picks up the book is going to feel like they're, they're holding a piece of art, which is really wonderful. But the story itself is wonderful. Uh, it starts with you having a conversation with your son, who's named Z in the book. Mm -hmm. He's a real son, obviously. He's a real son, yep. yes. Uh, and he is now, I think you said he was six when you started. Mm -hmm. He's nine or 10 he's now. He's 10 now, yeah. he's eight when the book finishes, yeah. yeah. But he's asking some really tough questions. I mean, first he's yes. obsessed with Michael Jackson, but then he's asking some really tough questions about uh, skin color and what it means to be different. And you're married to a Jewish white male, and yes. that conversation sort of envelops. and it gets into a deeper conversations, and a lot of this is you walking around New York working through questions that your son is asking. Absolutely, you. because it started out actually really funny. The obsession with Michael Jackson, you know, there were really funny questions. There was a point at which he was saying, because um, we'd gotten him all the album covers, and he said, is Michael Jackson, is he brown or is he white? And I said, well, you know, he's, he's black, and he, um, and then he sort of, uh, and as you look at the album covers, you know, he could sort of turn, turned whiter and he said he turned white and I said yeah and he said are you gonna turn white and I said no and he said daddy you know and I was like daddy's already white and he said but was he always and I was like oh I've broken my child and and it was it was both funny and kind of intensely strange fielding that question versus one that came up not too much longer which is um, are white people afraid of brown people Right. And he asked it in this really sweet chirp. Are white people afraid of brown people? And I was like, this is a, yeah. this is, is my a dad afraid of me? Is basically. my dad afraid of me? Yeah. And, and just knowing that we were having that disparity of conversation, knowing that he was getting that idea because he was seeing what was happening with Ferguson, he was seeing Trump beginning to run for office and understanding little bits of information were sort of seeping through to him and making him really question what was happening around him in a way that was both guileless and devastating. But also in the way that you layer on your own experience. I mean, what happens then in the book is you start to go back into your own life as a child. Yeah. And skin color was important at that age too, and in ways that you didn't understand when yeah. you were younger. So your, mo your mother and father came together in, a, in an arranged marriage mm -hmm. and came together and it's worked. There's a really wonderful path, like section in here where they sort of fall in love like however many 40 years later. But the skin, color of skin was like sort of brutally explained to you by your aunties and your relatives about what that meant. And the darker yeah. you were, the lighter you were. So that skin color played yeah. into your life too. Absolutely, and you know what's really funny about this is I notice when I um, talk to Americans about this book and about skin color, all of the, sometimes the, the things that are going on with Trump and America, people are sort of like, well that, who knows them? But you know what the real problem is, is that your own grandmother told you that you were too dark and, and they can somehow see that and the really damaging effect of that in the way that they can't quite correlate what it means to have a president who does not like his brown, the brown part of his country. Um, and, and growing up with that, growing up with that idea of being too dark in India being too dark here, but I, you know, in the way that it's, in the way that you sort of learn, okay, well, I'm one of many, 
in India, it felt I was more, I was sad to find out that that's how India felt about me. I was sad about how sad they were about the way I looked. Yeah, there's a line in here where your father says, no, don't worry, you're a pretty girl. And it says the first time that you recognize that that meant the darker you were, that there's this perception that you weren't pretty for some reason. Yeah, and it's, um, and it's interesting because I, I feel that the way that color works in India is a little bit akin to how obesity works in the United States, meaning you'll often hear people say, and I hate this when they say, you know, she, she'd be so great, she has such a pretty face. Um, and, the, and the implication is if she just didn't have that body, she'd be whatever that person's idea of beautiful is. In India, I feel like that's a little bit how color worked for it. It was like the, there was a great tragedy of my, of my life with my family, which is like she could have been, and yet the skin, <laughs> yes. the skin. <laughs> that's terrible. I, I mean, it is, but I'm laughing. Yes, yeah. I mean, there is humor in it, I suppose, <laughs> because you sort of see it as an old world perspective, but maybe it still exists, and that's something you're start trying to push aside. There's so many of those kind of uh, strange lessons in the book of, of perceptions. I mean, one of the things was you going to school here in America and dating other white kids mm -hmm. or whoever and their fascination with your color of skin or something else that came into play. And it's things that they thought about that you didn't necessarily think about, but that you sort of played along with, that you just didn't want to necessarily feel other or stand out or cause a scene, but they would bring up things that made you question yourself again. Absolutely, and it works both ways, right? Because there's the, there are the kids that I went to school with and the assumptions they made about me. Also, I didn't have a lot of other Indians I was growing up with. It says in the book that my parents were the third family to move into New Mexico, according to the other two yeah, first families. Yeah, I love that little. And um, yeah, real, real <laughs> scientific there. But really, there weren't very many of us. So, so, so much of your identity at that point is what your friends tell you about yourself. Right. So if they think that you're an oddity, you feel like you're an oddity. At the same time, a little bit later in the book, I explore my first boyfriend was black. And I put on to him immediately some of the perceptions that I had gotten from television and from watching the news and from you know what the media said about black boys. And, and I think it was important for me to explore both of those things, both how people implicated me, but also how I implicated other people. Yeah, there's a scene in that book, in the book again, where somebody says, one of your friends who's white says to you and your black boyfriend, you guys are a perfect couple. And, he, and you say, oh, thank you. And he says, didn't you see that they were doing it? Because he's sensitive yeah, to the idea. Yeah, because he said you look good together. Yeah, you look good together. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah, and he gets really mad. And he says, why do you let them say and that to you? you didn't understand that at first. No, and I was like, but we do look good together. <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's another level of sensitivity yeah. that's happening that you're stepping into. And at the, you know, I will tell you, that was one of those things that at the time, it took me a few years to understand what in him was broken by that moment and what he understood in a much sharper way than I did, right? And so I feel like a lot of this book is about what you learn about yourself in, what, in which moment and, and kind of learning to value yourself and learning what those perceptions are destroying in you and then being able to stand up for yourself and also being able to treat others with the sort of dignity that they, but the, but the inherent part of this book is that we're flawed and we don't come to that right away. Right. We make a lot of mistakes on the way to that place. Well, you were younger though when you were coming up with these things, but nonetheless, you were doing a lot of heavy lifting, understanding race and, and, and race relation and sort of how you uh, re relate to other people that white people never think about. I mean, literally ever. ever. I, I mean, know, tell me. There's so much work that you're doing, yeah, your boyfriend at the time, you mm -hmm. were doing at the time, thinking, deep thinking, and that your son Z was doing that most white people never ever think, even the most woke half the time, never have to deal with all that. And there's also, let's talk about that because I think there's also the idea of wokeness, right? That's this idea that like, You've been woke, and now you will never again yes, make these mistakes. Course. And you have traveled to the planet of wokeness, and now you can look back on the place you once were and laugh at those people. And for me, it has only ever been a process of waking. It has only ever been a, a point at which I feel like I understand a little bit more of who I am and also how I'm living all over other people and what I, what I am doing to them and how that affects them. There's only ever been a learning curve for but that's me. That's so fundamentally different than so many people that live in this country and elsewhere. I mean, the idea of having to do that work or enjoying the process of evolving constantly, never being done. 
Okay, but let's talk about that because I think that there, one of the things that's really painful for me to see right now is how much shame people have in talking about race. I feel like they don't even, part of the reason I drew a book about this is because nobody wants to talk about it. They're sort of sick to death of it. And yet this is my life and this is my son's life and this is the world that he's going to be moving into. And I feel like part of what's happening is people have such a, a sort of shame response to what is actually a human process. You don't know everything. Mm -hmm. You do have to figure it out. It is shameful. It is painful. Keep going. You know. Well, you, you treat it with humor throughout the book. There's a point where you're talking to your husband Jed. Yes. Again, a Jewish white male. Yes. Uh, and you claim that he's doing the white guy thing or whatever, mm -hmm. and he has to check himself because he realizes he is. And and you laugh during that scene. You don't hold it against him necessarily because there's love there and there's understanding. Yeah. And. He's trying, I guess. You know, he like is trying, <laughs> and it is, and it's about darkness, right? He says um, to me, he says, "Well, I never thought you were too dark to marry." You know, like yeah. <laughs> giving him a little pat on the shoulder. I was yeah. like, "Jet, yeah, you're not doing that white guy thing where you pretend that this is about you being enlightened instead of it being about you just never realizing that people of color can also see color." And he immediately was like, "Yeah, no, of course, was never doing that. Who would do that?" You know, he's <laughs> he's very funny. Yeah, um, but also this is. We have an interracial relationship, and I think America has a fantasy about how that works, where it's like, if you have an interracial relationship, it's because you have communed in some deep way, and you're operating on some higher racial nirvana. There's that fantasy, right? And then there's the opposite, because people know that can't possibly be true. So the opposite is, actually, nobody could really feel that way. So there's a deep distrust for people that move outside their race that are dating interracially. It's like, somebody in that relationship doesn't like themselves, and they, or they don't like their race, and they're secretly carrying shame and not giving themselves what they deserve. And I just wanted to show the truth of it, which is that we mess up all the time. We break each other all the time. We fight all the time. We don't get each other all the time. And we also come back into those rooms with that shame and with the hardness between us and talk about it. And I don't know if it's perfect, but it's real and it's okay. We're still standing. Yeah, I love that. You know, uh, the, the, as we read the book too, you start to feel the, the family dynamics between your parents and your yeah. brother mm -hmm. and who you marry mm -hmm. and how they married and how you find your mate. And that was a fascinating section of the book as well. Just understanding how the evolution of a relationship can happen it doesn't feel like anyone ever held necessarily the arranged marriage against them. You probably questioned it at some point. I know you and your brother had a tight thing yeah. with each other. Um, and yet, there's this loving component to your parents that, I mean, maybe I'm reading more into it than was there, no. but that's what it felt like. It was, you know, my parents had an arranged marriage. They never spoke to each other before they got married. And, I don't know, 25 years later, they fell pretty deeply in love. And it was amazing to see that happen and it also totally messed me up. Because before then, I had had an idea of like, well, we're Indian, so we, we may not have the, what my mother calls American love, we may not have the passion, but we stick American with love. each other. Yeah. And we are, we are true to each other and we sort of function in this world as a very tight unit and that's enough. And then when they fell in love, it was like, it was a, honestly, it was like my heart just was like, now what do we do? Because yeah. if they can fall in love, then they can fall out of love. And what does it mean to have parents that sort of held this careful distance suddenly really be into each other in a way that was obvious to me and my brother? Yeah. And then when your brother stepped out and- Started dating yeah. an Indian woman. Yeah. When he dated an Indian woman, mm -hmm. that was all she wrote. You were in trouble from that point on. You were running solo. Yeah. Yeah. And he, and yeah, I was in mean, the minute he started dating an Indian woman. I, of course, because it's clearly all about me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I said, um, you're ruining my life. And he was like, what this is, what are you doing? Yeah. This doesn't have anything to do with you. So what did your brother think about this book after you finished it? I mean, he was, he was hilarious. The first time I drew it, I, so as I said, I wasn't, um, I wasn't an illustrator. I taught myself to draw over the years that I was doing this book. Um, I stayed up many, many nights. So the first versions of him, let's say it was a little more Frankenstein, a little less my actual brother. So his first thing was like, can you please make me not look like that? But then when he read it, I think he laughed a lot. Um, he, say, he asked if Hassan Minaj can play him in the movie. Yeah, I was like, I'll go. definitely get on asking Hassan <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. That'll work. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to ask if you had to go back and talk to all the people that were in the book or find them all and get permission to even 
nod in their direction, even if you're not using real names and things like that. Did you go track them down? I actually did. I tried to track down everybody. There's a teacher that shows up in the book. Her Mrs. name is Morrell. Mrs. Morrell. I know. I wanted to ask you about Mrs. Morrell. Mrs. Morrell, who really had a kind of sizable impact on my life. Um, she was very upright, very sturdy American citizen, and we kind of go through a moment together um, where I was, I had won the Daughters of the American Revolution um, essay writing contest, and they had given us the wrong directions to to the luncheon. Um, that's as close as I can figure out what happened. We went to where the she luncheon was, was being held. I know that. It was not being held there. She found out where it was being held, and we walked into that place together. So I'm not sure exactly what the mishap was, but it was real. And she said, um, and she took me aside after that lunch and she had these kind of this very strong moment with me where she said, I want you to know something. You are an American. And it doesn't matter where your parents came from. It doesn't matter. When you come here, you are an American. And, and it was terrifying to me when she said that because I definitely thought, you know, I was like 11. I was like, I don't know what I've done to not be an American, but it was bad. Somebody else had that conversation with her, obviously, and she was, I mean, clearly sticking up for you. She was clearly sticking up for me, and you know what's really funny about that, and, and, it, and it's true of a lot of the conversations in here, I didn't know until I was 19, and I was sort of sitting around one day thinking about like, oh, that time I disappointed Ms. Morell, and she was angry with me, and then I started thinking through that moment, and I didn't I, know. And I didn't know, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, oh, she was trying to help me. Oh, she, was, she had my back. And it was so surprising. I actually tried to go find her um, when I was, so that's what we were talking about. I tried to go find her when um, I was drawing this because I wanted to ask her what really happened in that moment. I remember you saying this, and I remember us going to the wrong place. What happened? She had passed, but I did find her daughter. Well, the way you wrote that scene lends to that exact sort of revelation that you had because you start us off, I was under the impression that Mrs. Morell was not a good character, yep. that she was going to wrap you on the knuckles with a, with, a, you know, with a pen or something if you did something wrong. She probably did that too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and she does look like E.T. in the book, which you say. <laughs> you drew her like E.T., I'm telling you. I had a and lot I, of fun drawing her. <laughs> and, but she came to your defense, it was clear, in the, the way you wrote her, at least the revelation you think you had. Yeah. And that's an amazing thing, that you, there's this other side to people, that there is something that we don't always see at first glance on other people. You know what is really nice about thinking about her for me is she was one of the first people to really teach me what it meant to be an American. And so the idea that in that moment when this group that she loved was not seeing me, that she said to me, no, I see you and you are part of us, that changed my perception of what this country could mean to me mm -hmm. and, and how willing this country was to have a person like me be an equal citizen, mm. right? That was really identity shaping for me in a way that is enormous and that takes a kid's psyche and it stays there and it grows you into the kind of adult that you become. This book has the opportunity, the backdrop of what's happening and you write about the Trump era in here and you write about yeah. parents watching Fox News and you write about, I don't think you mentioned Fox News, I think you sort of dance around, but you write about the entire world we're in right now it has the opportunity to be one of those books that are emblematic of a moment in time. And that's so important for the moment, on how you've sort of captured that, mm -hmm. the zeitgeist of that. But also, it's something that you can give to your son at some point. Yeah. And that hopefully will help inform him. Have you thought about when he'll be ready to read this Oh, he's book? read it. He's 10 and he snuck the Did book he get it? away. And he told me afterward that he read all the scenes, even the bad ones. I should be clear, <laughs> this is not a children's book. Yeah. Right, there's plenty in here that's not for kids. Yeah. I think there are part, portions of it that a kid can understand. Yeah. It was a little bit above his, um, his level in certain ways, but I think he was really happy to get it. He's happy to read it. Um, what's really interesting to me right now is that it's sort of gone out in this last week, and so many people are writing me saying, I haven't talked to my ex, my, I haven't talked to my parents, I haven't talked to my in-laws, I'm sending them this book which is really interesting to me because I feel like it's just one way to at least start a conversation yeah. for them. And that, I didn't intend to write it for that purpose, but it's really heartening to know that that's where it's gone. Yeah, your whole vibe though, so one of self-deprecation, one of openness, 
one of you, you thought you'd failed your son or broken your son. Yes. This whole idea yep. of there's a humor to it all, even though there's a fear, a real fear, and real under trying to figure things out. Yeah. Um, I think is is a is a mood that's really welcome right now. I mean, I I, I love the tone, even Thank the you. sort of presentation yeah. as well. It's yeah. very inviting. It just wants you to sort of sink your sink your teeth into it and dive in deeper. Oh, thank you. So I, I love the book. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I'm thankful. I won't call you Mira Jacobs like Mrs. Morrell. Okay. You're Mira Jacob. I'm Mira Jacob. And the, the book is Good Talk. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. book. I recommend it to everybody. And thank you so much for coming thank by. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. All right, folks. All right. We're still not done. There's more to come at AWP 2019. I'm Rich Folly, and you're watching PBS Books. <laughs>